Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our show, Why Did I Attend a PWI? I am your host, Michelle Campbell, and I'm excited to be here today for our third show of the year to discuss being Black at a PWI. For those of you who don't know what PWI is, PWI stands for Predominantly White Institution. These are institutions where the community makeup has more white students than any other ethnic group on campus. From 2000 to 2018, college enrollment rates among 18 to 24 year olds increased for those who were black from 31% to 37%. A report by the National Center of Education Statistics states that roughly 12.9% of Black undergraduate students attend historically Black colleges and universities, although only obtaining 12.9% of the total Black undergraduate population, HBCUs graduate approximately 21.5% of all Black undergraduates. The remaining 87.1% of Black undergraduates who attend PWIs graduate at a rate of 78.5%. So let that sink in for a second. If you have 100 Black college age individuals, 37 of them will go to uh, college. Out of that 37, five will attend an HBCU and then 32 will attend a PWI. Out of that five who attended an HBCU, only one will graduate. Out of 32 who attended a PWI, 25 will graduate. So besides increasing your chances of graduating if you attend a PWI, I've invited some of my personal friends and graduates from PWIs to share with us why they made the choice to attend that school. They will also share with us their stories of the good, the not so good, the inspiring and fun in attending a PWI. Tonight's panelists are Marie Warsham Banks, Fred Crutcher, and Lloyd Stallings. And I'll give you a little bit of background information on each of them. Starting with Marie, as an entering freshman in 1991, Marie Warsham Banks immediately noticed that there were few, if any, Black American women that graduated from the University of Vermont with an engineering degree. Upon graduation in 1996, Marie became the first African-American woman to graduate with a BS degree in engineering from UVM. After being offered a position garnered through the Career Development Center on campus, Marie began her engineering career at 9X, now Verizon, as an outside plant engineer in Brockton, Massachusetts. She has been with Verizon for 25 years in various engineering capacities. Currently, Marie is a senior network engineer and designs networks on 5G platforms with an emphasis in multi-access edge computing. She has a master's in science in telecommunications from Stevens Institute of Technology and is very active in her church and community. Marie is widowed widowed and lives in Michigan with her two daughters, Kristen and Lauren Banks. Welcome to the show, Marie. Thank you. Next, we have Fred Crutcher. He is currently the service delivery manager, lab IT systems at Borg Warner Incorporated, and also serves as the chief operations officer for Crescendo Detroit, a nonprofit music and arts program focused on underrepresented youth ages five through 17. Frederick is also a licensed elder at the Community Church of Christ located in Detroit, Michigan. Frederick graduated with a BS in electrical engineering from Michigan State University in 1993. Frederick, born and raised in Northeast side of Detroit, loves to travel with his wife of 21 years and his daughters ages 19 and 18. He also loves going to MSU football games and playing golf. Welcome to the show, Fred. Thanks for having me. Last but certainly not least, we have Lloyd Stallings, 
born and raised in the Chicagoland area. He is a graduate of the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign with a BS in accountancy. He also completed a dual degree program at the University of Maryland University College, having obtained an MBA as well as an MS in International Management. He has worked across multitude of industries, including government, manufacturing, financial services, gaining years of multifaceted experience in the areas of accounting, audit, risk management, and compliance. He currently is employed as a senior manager in risk management and internal controls for Amtrak Incorporated. Last but not least, he is an active life member of the Omega Sci-Fi, sci -fi, sorry about that, Omega Sci-Fi Fraternity Incorporated. Welcome to the show, Lloyd. Thank you. Thank you. So with that, I think we should go ahead and get started. This is an exciting topic, and I'm sure those that are listening in cannot wait to get right into it. So let's start with the very first question. And anyone on the panel, feel free to, um, you know, give your stories, uh, answer the question, but, you know, feel free to give your stories and background to support your answer. We'll start right at the top. So what made you decide to attend a PWI? And anyone can take that. Ladies first. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Um, so I attended uh, Recast Tech High School in Detroit, Michigan. Lloyd, I'm sure you met someone from my high school either being from Chicago. Yes. <laughs> it was the best high school, but no offense. Michelle or Fred. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I get it all the time. My brother went there, so anyway. Exactly. Um, but I actually, you know, I have a different perspective. I chose University of Vermont very in a, a very unorthodox uh, manner. I most of my school went to Michigan State and University of Michigan. Yes, they did. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to do something different. Um, as a high school student, I went, I was on Wayne State's campus for six weeks. I went to Michigan State for a summer for six weeks. And I went to University of Vermont for a summer for six weeks. University of Vermont had a program for high school students that paid $400 a week for six weeks in 1990. That was my introduction. So, of course, they recruited me like an athlete. I didn't recruit them. I didn't apply for them. When I decided what school I was going to had two criteria. Did they have my major and how much money they were mm -hmm. So my decision was very simple. It was a race on who gave me the most money. I got accepted to Michigan State, Michigan, Purdue, Grand Valley State. Who gave me the most money is how I made my choice. We'll get into some more details a little bit later on maybe if there's prospective students looking to figure out why how to make a choice between the PWI and the HBCU, and I'll give some context to maybe how they should make their decision. But in 1991, as someone who didn't have parents who saved for them to go to college, it was basically a decision of scholarship, and did they have my major? Mm -hmm. That's it. That was pretty good. For me, I'll jump in here right now. For me, it was. Um, easy for me, first of all, because my um, brother was already attending uh, Michigan State University. But second, um, the church I attended when I was in high school um, was, a, you know, of course, a well-educated church full of, um, um, you know, folks who were, who had graduated from um, Michigan and Michigan State, you know, Wayne State, Case Western. So we had a lot of you know, people, you know, from those schools who, who were um, who were my mentors? A couple of the guys were in, actually electrical engineers, you know, working for um, AT and T that were Michigan State graduates. So it was a, it was easy for me. And then of course for me, I went to Osborne. So you know, being accepted to Michigan State was kind of a prestigious thing, right? Coming from the fact that um, my brother and I were the first two um, college um, students, you know, in our family, that made that made you know. You know that was like a prestigious thing um, for me to um, to go to Michigan State. So that was, I guess, it, it's a short answer. You know for why I attended um, a PWI. And like I said, I didn't even know PWI. The term PWI existed until 
you know, a few months ago when my daughter mentioned it. But yeah, um, that's why I attended uh, Michigan State University. And, I, and, 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 and Fred, <clears throat> I'm the same way as you. I, that PWI term was not very popular back in the late 80s, early 90s. So if somebody would have said that to us back then, it was all about just going to school, going to college. Mm -hmm. And, you know, playing ball in high school. I attended Proviso East High School in Maywood, Illinois, <clears throat> um, which is, again, right outside of Chicago. And, and all we talked about was going to school. And, and schools were the big schools. We went to football camp at the University of Iowa. You know, we, we, my cousin, when I was a little kid, I used to always go see him play football at Illinois. So we, that's what we knew. You know, we didn't mm -hmm. hear anything about HBCUs and the, the relevance of, you know, learning black culture because we had black culture. We grew up celebrating Martin Luther King's birthday before it was a national holiday. We were, were taught, you know, the, the transgression in life. And I, and I learned this uh, at a young age, in fourth grade, was to go to graduate grade school, graduate high school go to college, get married, and be a productive citizen in the world. Our teachers never steered us toward an HBCU or what now is known as a PWI. They just steered us to go get an education in college. And mm -hmm. those are the schools that came to us and that we knew about. So most of my friends went to either U of I, Northern Illinois, Southern Illinois, Western Illinois. But these were all state schools. Or if they went outside, they went to Michigan State, Michigan, Wisconsin, Iowa, Nobody talked about HBCUs like that. So it wasn't a prevalent thing or important that we go to HBCU. It was just more important to us just going to school. And those are the schools that were presented to us at the time. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah, I, I think that's really important what uh, Lloyd just said. Um, my parents both attended HBCUs. They didn't graduate from HBCUs. Mm -hmm. but my parents both attended a University of Arkansas at Pine Bluff. But... At that time when they were in school, that was the only choice they had. Mm -hmm. So a lot of my friends that attended HBCUs, their parents graduated from the HBCUs. And a lot of times when you matriculate through those universities, the, the love and the loyalty to them gets embedded in their own culture within their family. And it mm -hmm. becomes a generational thing because like Lloyd said, there was no talk about HBCUs at school. There was no talk about HBCUs just even in my house because I don't think my parents made a choice to go. It was that was the only place that was offered mm -hmm. for them. And so um yeah, that that in our um time period, it definitely there wasn't a push. There there definitely there wasn't and I actually went on an HBCU college tour, a black college tour when I was in high school. Mm. And we visited with AKA teams and we visited a lot of historically black colleges. But even in that tour, nothing really resonated with me because it looked like my high school experience. Mm -hmm. like my, my, my neighborhood. And I really didn't know what to ask or what what culture meant. I didn't know what I didn't know what to ask. I just knew what it looked like. Mm -hmm. And so it didn't resonate with me any different than going to visit my sister at Michigan State on uh, to go see, you know, Ebony Reflections. And, and, <laughs> and I'd like to piggyback on two things Marie just said. Uh, first off, not knowing, you know, again, my, my mom uh, attended Mississippi State and my dad, he, he went to the Army. But again, that's a, a again, a PWI. But that was the local school to where she lived. So most of us, most, you know, our friends, our parents couldn't afford to pay the out-of-state right. fees to a lot of these schools. So we mainly mm -hmm. looked at state schools, you know, and what right. were the state schools, you know, or local, or, or if somebody got a scholarship, they would go. Mm -hmm. But again, mm -hmm. scholarships for, for my school, we had a lot of pro basketball players, you know, Mike Finley, who came out of Wisconsin, went to our, they got offered mm -hmm. scholarships <clears throat> to the quote-unquote PWI. So that's, again, what we knew, number one. So money, so money talked when it came to that. It was, it was, a, it was a good option financially. You know, the other thing, again, you know, and, and hearing about HBCUs, we would hear that, again, they had great homecomings, but you never heard about their academics. Nobody ever talked about their sports. And then the running joke was, it's just the 13th grade. i like, well, I don't want to go there. If this is going to be the 13th grade. I want to go somewhere, you know, and, and the, the University of Illinois had a major. They were number one at the time when I went to school in accounting. So that's what I wanted to major in. So I was looking, what was the best option for me? So once I came out of school, I had good options for jobs employment and something that I felt, you know, I can hang my hat on 
wherever I went. And Illinois gave me that option. So, mm-hmm. again, I, I didn't get a selling point from HBCU that we have a, a great, you know, accounting program. I mean, I look down. Not that I look down. I shouldn't say that. That's a bad word. But I, I looked at some of the other schools, the Western Illinois, the Southern Illinois, at schools that I wouldn't go to because their accounting program wasn't as strong as Illinois. So I looked down on those programs like – I don't want to go there because I want to go to the best program for what I want to major in. And that's what Illinois offered for me. Again, it wasn't about a HBU versus the PWI to me. It was about what's the best option for me, you know, major wise. Right. And, yeah. and, and I'm glad you, um, you, you said something that, that triggered me because uh, one of my mentors mentioned to me, because uh, for me being in the Detroit area, I was always interested as an engineer to be an automotive. Right, the automotive mm-hmm. industry, and one of the things that my mentor said to me back in the day, because I did get accepted to Morehouse, I was one of the schools I got accepted to, uh, was Morehouse. And um, one of the, um, the things that one of my mentors said to me is that when you are, and this is not to you know look down on it, but remember this is like 30, 30 years ago, right? And so it was a different, you know, people talk about HBCUs now is different than what it was back, you know, 30, 30 something years ago. And what he what he said to me is that when you are, um, you know, like at a career fair, a career conference, or you're, you know, in the process of being interviewed for a job, you know, how many of your hiring managers, potential hiring managers, are gonna know what this particular school is, right? And and so they said you just you never want any yeah. questions, right, about anything as it relates to what's on your resume or, or what you what you've done in school. So a lot of folks in this area. And, and even in the in, in the Michigan, you know, in southeastern Michigan, you know, it could have been, you know, you went to U of M was the main reason why you got the job, wasn't necessarily, you know, how smart you were in school or, you know, uh, how your interview was. It was the fact that you were a U of University of Michigan graduate and the hiring manager was a University of Michigan graduate. So, you know, it was, yeah. he was already sold on the fact that you were going to, you know, be hired into the place. Yeah. And so that Michigan State thing and that U of M thing, you know that that made a difference in this area. You know, um, at that time back in the day. So, like I said, my mentor said, you don't want any. You know, you don't want a hiring manager questioning. You know, what kind of school is this, or where is this school located, whatever. So that was a big that was a big deal for me at that time. That's a good um, good input. I can tell you just for me personally, um, I actually did look at an HBCU. I looked at Spelman, and I thought about it. I said, but I knew at the time I wanted to be an engineer. And what they told me was that I could not finish my complete my full degree there. I would have to go to Georgia Tech and do some additional classes and things to actually get a degree. And for me, coming from a small Catholic uh, high school, I was like, that's too much. I just I, I want something simple. I want to be able to be in the same spot and graduate, start there and graduate from there. And I didn't know the complexity. It might not have been real complex, but at the time for me, it was more than I wanted to take on. And um, plus I had a cousin, actually two cousins up at Michigan State at the time. So the decision to pick Michigan State uh, was kind of easy for me. One was already in engineering. Uh, She was in mechanical. And then um, I had two cousins or a cousin and his fiance were at Wayne State doing chemical. And that was the kind of reason why I picked electrical. I said, I'll just pick something different. You know, they got mm-hmm. chemical and mechanical. I'll do electrical, not really knowing because <laughs> truth be told, I didn't know. I took a DAPSAP, that's a Detroit area pre-college engineering program. Um, but we did more civil engineering uh, activities. So I really didn't even know like what it meant to be an electrical engineer. I just knew mm-hmm. that I was pretty good at it. And I said, okay, Michigan State has a program. <laughs> and yeah, so hey, I'm, I'm, I'm at State. And that's pretty much <laughs> how I got there. Um, but, uh, I think I, all your points that you mentioned kind of resonates with uh, me as well. We're going to go to the next question. So what was your experience like being a black man or a black woman on a predominantly white campus? Um, for me, it's probably going to be very different than Fred's and Lloyd's, um, because out of 14,000 students, there was like 50 black people. And of the 50 black people, there was probably like 25 that came from urban areas. So you might have a black person that was actually born and raised in Vermont, and that's a totally different culture than being mm-hmm. born and raised in New York City, Baltimore, oh, yeah. or uh, Detroit, or Chicago. 
So it was like a group of 25 students. In engineering, there was it was me. Mm. Um, there was a couple of guys that were a little bit, maybe two years behind me, but it was me. Um, back in the 90s, there was no place to get your hair done. <laughs> there was no Frank's hot sauce in the grocery store. Mm. There was no um, Laurie seasoning sauce. Um, <laughs> it was. Come on. <laughs> I'm appalled. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Clutching pearls. I know. <laughs> it was interesting. But what we did, we did connect together. Um, we would go to other schools and find black people. We would actually go to basketball games. Mm. And when the other team had black guys on their team, we would go sit over there <laughs> and, and root for them. Um, oh, no. <laughs> wow. Uh, it was bad. But we had, it was isolating at times. Um, but me being from Detroit, I learned how to survive. I, I, I learned how to survive. I really, I fell in love with hip hop because I was on the East Coast, like, getting cutting edge music and I found my own space. And so uh it was a time that it was tough. It wasn't like we never had the numbers that University of Illinois had or Michigan State. Never. Our sports teams, we had like one black guy quota, maybe two black guy quota on the basketball team. Wow. Um so it you when when students are making a decision on like my, my, my oldest daughter, she wants to play basketball in college. It means something when the existing basketball team is all white. That's a very deliberate choice to have an all white basketball team. Yeah, they don't want to win. <laughs> well, they win sometimes, but what I'm saying is that you have to know, really get into the, the underground of what that means, like the context of really what that means. So um, sometimes depending on where you go, the culture on that campus is not embracing. We went to school when affirmative action came out mm -hmm. and there were so many discussions that automatically assumed that I was only an engineer because of affirmative action, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that they only recruited me because I was a double minority, that they only um, allowed me to be in the school of engineering um, to put me on a a brochure. I, and that's how come you all have all your school stuff. <laughs> I don't have any because I um, I just didn't have that relationship. So for me, it was tough, but I was very focused and determined to leave there with my degree. Mm -hmm. And so, and that's what I came there for. And I did meet very, make very valuable friendships with other students of color. Good. Experience, yeah. Hmm. Fred or Lloyd? I'll let Fred go again. Oh, okay. I was I was thinking, my kids, because I mean, obviously, you know, Michelle, the experience we had at uh, Michigan <laughs> State. Um, I mean, you know what? It was you know, Michigan State is a big campus, right? And like yeah. at that time, I believe it was forty four thousand students, and we had like forty five hundred black students, only represented ten percent of the uh, population. But you know, between me staying in Brody Complex, right? Yeah. <laughs> you know, with, with, between me staying at Brody Complex and me being an engineer student in one of the biggest, you know, NSBE, you know, National Society of Black Engineer chapters in the country, mm -hmm. that, you know, did it, right, for me. Um, and plus, you know, and the overall thing was affirmative action case or whatever you want to call it, I felt that I belonged, right? So I felt that I deserved it and I belonged there. So even if those conversations came up, and which they really did, um, you know, in, in my, because I know, because I stayed, I stayed in Butterfield and and most of the other students, the white students, Asian students, whatever, we all got along, you know, pretty good. I think what was, what was key back in 1988 was a lot of, People in this area, in the southeastern Michigan area, uh, I met a lot of people, um, white, uh, young white men, young white women, who were from other parts of Michigan, like Fenton and Clarkson and some of these areas that weren't heavily populated back then in the 80s, right, in the late 80s. And so so us coming on 
campus, I've always been cool, kind of cool guys, you know. You know, I've always been a kind of you know, have fun, you know, kind of dude. Um, plus, the, the fact that um, I like to give credit to um, you know MTV Raps for introducing a lot of white people to black you know culture mm -hmm. too. So that that you know that your MTV Raps thing with MTV, you know, in '88. And and us coming up there, you know, being cool, that did that did a lot for um, you know, for us. So, you know, so it seems like you know, because you know how we how we talk about how we we felt like we were at the black school just based on our experience anyway. Let me just say, because we had so many black students and we were all you know kind of unified and together, and so it felt like at times it felt like a black college, you know, it, 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 it felt like a it felt like a black college anyway. So um, <laughs> so we had great times, and I've had and I and I and I have great friends, you know. I've, Tons of black friends all over the country, and I even still have some of my white friends, you know, that were engineering students or in the dorm that I'm still in contact with and still with, you know, catch up with. So it was great. It was a great experience to me. Like I said, the main thing for me was that I belonged there, right? And mm -hmm. I knew that, and I felt I was confident in that. So nothing could stop me. There you same, go. Same, same confidence I had. I mean, again, my fourth grade teacher instilled that level of confidence in us. So I had the out, outstanding. Accounting student award in my high school. So going to U of I, I was like, I know I belong here. Now affirmative action never came up. We never talked about it. Nobody ever came to us and said you're here. With that, we never discussed that. Actually, the the most I heard about affirmative action was all the, the stuff that was going on at the University of Michigan around affirmative action at the time. We didn't have that issue. Um, so again, I, I felt I belonged because nobody was better than me. That was always my thought process. You know, mm -hmm. I, I was confident. And my ability uh, academically, athletically, whatever you want to call it. And so, again, the white students never, you know, I never looked at it as they were better than me, nor did they try to pretend that they were better. They just knew we were there. And so we we had projects. We got them done. And and I guess my experience is a little bit more softer than Marie's because I had a lot of folks from my grade school that went to U of I, from mm. my high school that went to U of I. So I automatically had either mentors or friends, you know, right away who could show me whatever I needed wherever I needed to go, what I needed to do. And I made friends easily. A lot of us are from the Chicagoland area, you know, uh, high schools, and we were only two hours outside of Chicago. So if we wanted something, we want, we, we went, we went home. You know, I, I remember I had to go home to vote because I forgot to change my voting rights over to Champaign and it was that important to vote. So I drove home, voted, hung out for a couple hours, said hi to my mom and drove back to school. I mean, that's just type of stuff we would do <clears> if <throat> we wanted to get things done. So it was never an uncomfortable situation at all so my experience was great as well we had about maybe four thousand black students at the time and if you put that in context that's that's bigger than hampton hampton mm -hmm. has three thousand black students so we're bigger than some hbcus yeah by our just the, the amount of students that we have and they all looked out for each other it was it appalled me once i got out of school and i was in the city working and i would speak to a black person and they didn't speak back mm -hmm. you know, we we're like, what? And, you know, and that blew my mind because everybody spoke on campus. <laughs> they sure did. Everybody, yeah, you know? we did. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Somebody knew you, or if they didn't know you, they knew your face because everybody spoke. And then, as far as classes, we made sure that if we needed help, we looked out for each other. We we talked to somebody who was, you know, had the class prior or had notes or whatever, and, and we always made sure that we helped each other out. So it was a community. You know, we made sure we got in and. You know, one of the things that uh, a, a prior panel I was on with a PWI experience versus HBCU experience, one of the HBCU folks said, oh, my professor cared for me. You know, he he called me if he didn't see me in class and made sure I came to class. And, and I'm sitting there like, dude, we were adults. You went to class. No professor called right. me. Right. But, my, but my professors did make sure that I got what I needed because I remember st struggling a little bit in tax class because I had uh, test anxiety. And I, I, I aced all the quizzes, I answered all the questions, but I, I bombed one of my tests. And I went to my professor and I said, what am I doing wrong? And he said, what are you studying? I said, I studied the guide you gave us and the book. He said, why are you studying the book? I gave you the guide. He said, you're overstudying. He hmm. said, you, you're stressing yourself. So they always looked out too. They gave office hours. They they were helpful. So they made sure that I, you know, me and anybody else, it wasn't just black students, it was any student, had the resources they needed to succeed. So when they said that, my professors care for me. I, I was looking at them like my professor cared for me, and he was a white guy. So, you know, I, I just felt nothing felt out of place for me being at, at University of Illinois. Yeah, I can I can say uh, for myself at Michigan State, um, 
and again, being in Brody, I think we were really, we had like this Mecca and if anybody ever been to Brody at Michigan state, it was like, it seemed to be predominantly black. Uh, they used to give us a name, call it the ghetto, but it wasn't the ghetto. It was just a lot of black folks over there. But mm -hmm. long and short of it is it was a lot of fun. And we congregated. It was like, I think, five or six different dorms that made up Brody Complex. And we all congregated in this centralized area for like breakfast, lunch and dinner, pretty much. And um, it was like a party whenever we get yeah. together because we had taken over the cafeteria you'd be yeah. there for hours you know mm -hmm. and it was just it so for me the only time i realized that it wasn't as black as i thought it was is when i went into my engineering classes right. but when you came back home you had all your people back with you yeah. so you know right. it was it was kind of not so bad uh yeah. experience right fred you yeah know? it wasn't bad you know we took over east it was east brody cafeteria because they had two separate Cafeterias. If you were eating over the north side of Brody, oh, right. you, you were, it was question. You know, we were like, "What are you doing? What are you, what are you doing over there?" You know, <laughs> <laughs> you know. But the east side of Brody Cafeteria was where we all congregated. Right? Yeah, and I always forgot it was two sides because I always went to that one on the left where you walked yeah, in. Right. I, I didn't even <laughs> exactly. know they had. Yeah, you're right. They sure did have another yeah. side. And so, and, and, and crazy as it was for me, I could, I, you know, I could care less about my professors. You know, I didn't. It was crazy because I didn't care about my professors cared about me. I didn't care about sitting in the front of the class. To be honest, I didn't care about none of that. Right? You know, so it was it was it was just weird. And if I need to help, I got help. But we had a strong support group because we had a lot of um in, in there, we had a lot of juniors and seniors um who were you know who had already taken you know classes with these professors. You know, mm -hmm. our Nesby group we had a massive test file. So we could go get the study guys and go get you know um, um, tests that other the other black students had taken in the previous year. So we had enough resources to make it happen. You know, plus you know from Detroit from the east side, you have to figure I'll it make out. It happen. <laughs> <laughs> I think for me, um, and I think for and I always talk in a context to people who are watching the broadcast that's making a decision. Okay. <clears throat> Because I think um, it matters. Um, experience matters. Numbers matter. And like culture matters. And that's something, mm -hmm. like I said, because I certainly was offered way more than Michigan State was offered as far as scholarships and, and, and computers. I mean, they, you'll get a job, you'll get a computer, you'll get all this. And so I really went um, because of that. But I think our experiences are different, but they were, it was rewarding in a sense that growing up in Detroit, I really only understood the culture of black people that migrated from the South to the North. That's pretty much the context of what I, um, but then when I went East, so I challenged students to think about, you know, you don't have to go to college in your backyard if you're able to, because I met black people from all over, like I never even heard of, Antigua before. Mm -hmm. I never even heard of Dominica. I heard of Dominican Republic, but never Dominica. I really never met a person from Haiti. And so because we all looked alike, mm -hmm. we spoke different languages, we came from different cultures. Um, I was exposed to Black culture in a more diverse way. Um, I think probably if I went to a Michigan state, I probably would have Still, kind of gravitated to people because so many people, Lloyd, went to Mich with the cast of Michigan State. My sister was mm -hmm. there. <laughs> Everybody went to University of Michigan, like from my school. So I think as people make choices, um, sometimes I challenge people to get out their comfort zone mm -hmm. because sometimes that's where growth exists. But I'll also say this, Michelle, it wasn't until I was in a Ronald McNair research fellowship, graduate fellowship program at the University of New Hampshire. And Ronald McNair was the astronaut that was killed in the Challenger. 86. Yes. <clears throat> it wasn't until I was in that program and I took some kids from Boston down to North Carolina A&T until I saw this, that the School of Engineering was named after him because he was a graduate of North Carolina A&T. And I got on that campus and I saw how articulate and how intelligent. I looked at the labs and I'm like, oh my gosh, 
and I got immersed in the culture there and I the the narrative and the perception of what I thought about mm -hmm. HBCUs was totally changed. Mm. I said, oh, I didn't know. Mm -hmm. I really, I, I really didn't know that they were producing this level of intellect. Ronald McNair was an astronaut. He went to MIT, like out of North Carolina A and T. Mm. When I saw like the the students on campus, and I really realized at that moment, I said I never really got in deep. My perception and the narrative that I had was not exactly accurate all the time. So I think that um, our takeaway is, it's always great to, to, to um, or my takeaway was, I, I, I did something different. I challenged myself um, and it wasn't always fun, but I, I learned how to make it to the, you know, the best experience possible. Mm -hmm. It was very fulfilling. Um, I got what I came for. Now, now, Marie, I, I wouldn't say that your perspective was wrong at the time because things have changed so much since we were in school. I mean, more money is being funneled to HBCUs. And if you really think about it, you have more Asians and Caucasians who are attending HBCUs for Tennessee State Engineering Program, North Carolina A&T a Program. So they get money, more money from the state by taking that diverse type of student body. So a lot of things are different now than what were then and like you said you know he went to mit and that probably gave him you know a little bit more exposure but if those you know those who didn't attend those institutions and make that particular network it may not have been the same back then so things a lot of things have changed and like michelle said earlier about spellman's um one to send her to, to georgia tech now they have dual degrees where you come out of both schools so a lot of things have changed and partnering and more mm -hmm. money is being funneled and programs that make it a totally different experience than when we were in school back when. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah that's a good point. Let's go to one of the next questions. How important were black student groups like caucuses, organizations, fraternities, et cetera, to your, um, I guess, getting you through and helping you cope uh, at a predominantly white campus? Uh, I'll go first this time, Dan, if you guys don't mind. I, I think it was very instrumental. I mean, I was a, a member of NABA and Minority Commerce Association back when. Again, being an accounting major, that was huge. Mm -hmm. um, for me, seeing people of like attainment who were trying to obtain degrees in my same field. You know, we got to meet the different partners, partners who looked like me from the ENYs, from the Deloitte and Touche, um, from the Arthur Anderson, which it was still around back when. So that was very important. You know, it, it was good to, to get those folks, study with those folks, because a lot of us, a lot of them were in my program. So we would study together. We would learn together. And those who were ahead of me, you know, would help mentor or tutor us, you know, if, if need be. So it was very important and very viable for us to have success at school. And also, you know, sort of knowing the path. I mean, one class that everybody took at school was English 260, which was uh, Black literature. So that really was a big place to meet you know, uh, different folks and, and, and learn different things about the culture. But joining those groups was, was just icing on the cake for me, you know, helping me uh, go along and get along and make the path that much smoother. Again, it was hard. You know, the accounting program wasn't no punk at U of I. They, they were very serious, you know, about maintaining that status. I mean, even today, they're number two and they're mad about it because, you know, huh. when, when I get on the, the business school calls, they're really mad. So they're trying to figure out how we can get that number one spot. <clears throat> Who but has the number one spot? Texas. Okay. Texas was always number two when I was in school. We were number one. So mm, they overtook like us it. somehow, some way, and we got to get it back. But but to, to answer the question and, and let the other panelists go ahead and, and opine, it, it was very important for me. That's good. And, and then as far as the, the social aspect, the fraternity and sororities, having parties, you know, um, having projects that we were out working with, and all, that was always huge as well. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Fred or Marie? I'm okay. I'm not going to force y'all to answer it. No, I, I was, uh, was going to say, well, for me, I was uh, waiting for Marie, but as soon as, you know, you know, you know how it was with us, Michelle. Nancy was the thing. Yeah. You know, 
for us at Michigan State. Uh, our chapter was the biggest chapter, one of the biggest chapters in the in the country. You know, our uh, our advisor, you know, Dr. Gerald Tompkins, he was the man, right? Yeah. Arliss, Dr. Arliss Wiggins, she was the she was it, and they helped us out. They really, you know, yeah. um, they really, uh, you know, gave us a leg up. You know, when we got to the university, because you know that, you know, because for us, that engineering 290 class was the class, right? It was. So tell them a little bit about what engineering 290 was. Yeah, well, Mr. Tom, obviously. Yeah, Dr. Tompkins uh, um, was the professor of the engineering 290 class, and basically, I would say it was it was it was a class of all the black, you know, the black engineer, you know, the black freshman engineering students, and it was, you know, for what I know, it was just a a, a, a class to, you know, um, get you on the right track, right? Mm -hmm. Resume writing, right? Um, how to dress, how to act, all that type of stuff we did in that in that particular class. And I mean, we even had a book. I was trying to think of the book that we had for that class, but we never really, you know, we never really <laughs> read the book, but yeah. he would, Tompkins would put you out on, you know, he would, he would stand you up and he would ask questions, you know, you know, oh, yeah. you know answer, yeah, he would definitely put you on the spot. But it was basically it was it was it was the book it was the class as an incoming freshman um, black freshman engineering student that taught you the ropes, right? Yeah. We had that we had Nesby, and then um, and then we had in our in our um, in our domes we had our black caucuses also. Mm -hmm. And for me, I was the um, I was the um, the government liaison for the you know for our dorm government. So I was you know I was going to our our, our dorm government meetings also, you know, representing the the, the Butterfield Black Caucus. So, uh, <laughs> so we, you know, so we had a lot of fun with Black Caucuses, and we had I, I had fun with you know some of the white students in the government also. Like I said, yeah. a couple of those guys I'm still cool with, you know, to this day. You know, so yeah, we, it was a great time. I think uh, for me, the Black Student Union was our saving grace. Thursday night at eight o'clock. Um, the world didn't come on there, but the Cosby Show came on, and then uh, I'm trying to think. Different Martin. world afterward? No, they it, it, they played Cheers twice. <laughs> oh, okay. So, so well, we would go to our Black Student Union meetings, and those were so important um, to us. We would dress up, we would you know get together, but we also had we leveraged being minority students on campus so we had a budget of like forty thousand dollars 30 years ago mm. and we brought speakers up we brought Naomi Markbar, we brought Miranda Karanga we brought uh Francis Chris Wesley we uh Chuck D Spike Lee um we had concerts Tribe Called Quest Patra we we had everything the uh, Anything you could think of that would bring cultural diversity to this school, they allowed us to do it, and they gave us money. They would fly us to the Black Man Think Tank Conference at the University of Cincinnati. Mm. We, would, we would really leverage being minorities on campus and would get money to travel to D.C. or to New York City for any type of conference that could make our experience uh better um at the university of vermont so we actually did so much um as a black student union and we connected to so many different schools um it was a lifeline for the inner city uh students at campus and i don't know i don't think i ever i was an officer probably for three out of the five years i was there um mm -hmm. we held a lot of recruiting weekends um, and I would fly all my cousins and friends knowing that they weren't coming, but mm -hmm. <laughs> um, it was, it was, um, it was an experience that, you know, uh, I met John, it was just so many people that I met that intellectuals that really shaped our, the, our political mindset, um, and really shaped me, um, of how I was going to re-enter my um, community when I got home and what kind of impact I felt like I needed to make mm -hmm. uh, was shaped through uh, all that um, learning 
and interacting with people who dedicated their life to social justice in the black community. So it was good. It was important to me. Okay. Well, we're going to shift gears and talk a little bit about now that you've graduated from uh, this PWI, um, in your respective careers, has the knowledge of you having attended a PWI giving you any noticeable level or type of treatment on the job? So the fact that you went to U of I, now people start hearing you a little bit better, or you went to Michigan and University of Vermont, and you're like, okay, this is a respectable school in my book, enough where I'm now going to give you the respect back. So just do you, have you experienced any of that in your professional career by the fact that you went to a PWI? Mm -hmm. hmm. Fred, I think Fred said, said a lot earlier when he talked about how his counselor said that, you know, the people you'd be working for, how they would respect you because they went to those schools or they mm -hmm. went to schools that were in that same, you know, conference or whatever. So um, that really helped when I came out of school, you know, having a counter degree from U of I, you know, they, again, the rankings were big back then. It's, it's, you know, always, you know, especially those that read the U S and news and world reports, you know, it, it was a big thing at, at the time when I was first looking for jobs and, you know, when they, people say, oh, you got to count, oh, Illinois, oh. So it, it you know, it, it resonates, again, because of the degree. You know, these days, I think with, you know, some other schools, same thing, with di different majors that are that are prevalent at those schools, it always matters. So, but yeah. it does help because, um, you know, I experienced a lot of different cultures at U of I. So not just white folks, you know, Asian, Indian, um, you know, different countries, Africans. You know, so I, I, I felt I was better prepared going out, knowing, you know, and, and communicating and, and networking with these different cultures. I remember going on an accounting trip and um, from one of the partners invited me to, and I was the only black guy there, mm. you know, only black person, period. And I was just like, wait, that's not right. <laughs> you know, because I, I I'm not sure why that was, because it was a bunch of us in the program, but I was the only one there. And, um, you know, at first I, I said, I felt a, some kind of way about it. And I thought about it, I'm like, you know, it's no different than anything else because, you know, I grew up again. Uh, my high school was mostly black, but the town I lived in was was mixed. I just lived on the other side uh, of, the, of the of Roosevelt Road, or, or if people would say the tracks. But I, mm -hmm. I knew how to I knew how to network and resonate and communicate with with people of different cultures. But again, Asian, white, you know, so it didn't matter. So I just started talking to them about you know my academic prowess and going to U of I and. I guess one of my buddies or whoever was on the boat was from Notre Dame. And I think mm -hmm. I know we had a crowd around us. Everybody's talking, you know, and I'm sitting there like, I'm this little, you know, this black guy and everybody's talking. The next thing I know, I got a letter from a partner from one of the uh, accounting firms saying, you're just the type of person we need at this mm -hmm. firm. And we didn't talk about anything but sports. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but the fact that I guess he saw I could communicate and network with folks who were unlike me and be so comfortable with it you know, really help, I guess, mm -hmm. form his opinion of me without truly knowing who I was just for a two hour chat. Mm -hmm. You know, we did talk some academics, but mainly sports and just, you know, no politics, of course, but everything else. So I think it helped out a lot, you know, helped me yeah. understand mm -hmm. the nature of things. I think for me, um, it, uh, when I graduated from the University of Vermont, I got my job before I graduated. Um, and I, I chose, I was going to be like Fred, I was going to come back to Michigan and work for the car companies. Mm -hmm. um, but I really wanted to go to grad school and I really wanted a company to pay for them to go, for me to go to grad school. So I came home and I got a job at GM. But their tuition program, I had to get my master's in mechanical engineering and it was kind of a reimbursement. Verizon was, you can get your, you can get your law degree, it didn't matter. And they pay for it up front. So I was like, okay, I'm going a, I'm to a, I'm a go because I wanted to get my MBA at the time. And so I said, I'm going to go to Verizon, or it was Niners at the time, stay there five years and come back to Michigan 26 years later. <laughs> I, I never left Verizon. So by me staying on the East Coast, me, my first job was in um, Massachusetts. Everybody was familiar with University of Vermont. We had plenty of engineering students that came from the University of Vermont. Probably, although I did come back to Michigan and get a job um, with the car company, but probably 
University of Vermont didn't necessarily hold the same weight as the Michigan State and Michigan if I had come back to Detroit to work. But because I stayed regional, um, I think that it, it certainly gave me a leg up. Um, but as Lloyd has mentioned, things have changed so much. Like Verizon, mm -hmm. we have, like I'm an HBCU ambassador, and like we literally go to HBCU campus and just recruit engineers out of Morgan State or North Carolina a &T. So I, I think it goes both ways. I think the killing thing is like Lloyd and Fred both had confidence. I, and I think I, I attribute it coming from Detroit. When I walked into my interview, he said, I don't think this job is for you. I said, why not? He said, oh, I think you might be better suited for something else. I said, what's the qualification for this job? He said, an engineering degree. I said, I got it and I want this job. Right. And I'm about to negotiate my salary because I had three summers of internships. Bam, bam, bam. <laughs> so at the end of the day, it's important where you go, but you got to, wherever you choose to go, you've got to have the confidence like Fred yeah. had, Chloe had, to say, I'm mm -hmm. here and I can bring value to any space that I occupy. So um, when you're you're choosing the spaces you're in, you're, you're, Lloyd is right. You got to be able to be oftentimes, and I'm sure Michelle working for Motorola um, and all your other companies you worked in, like you're often the only person of color mm -hmm. in those spaces, especially when you start going to executive levels, you're often, and you got to be able to navigate either way. And I think my ability to survive came from being in a predominantly black environment in Detroit, Michigan. I was yeah. like, okay. I'm gonna figure this out. Right. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. And I was able to I, I knew not to shut down the bridge because I was the only one. I'm like, there's something left on the table. Like Fred mentioned the east side came out the west side. I'm like, is there something on the table for the taking? I'm not gonna mm -hmm. walk away from it. I'm gonna get it. So yeah. yeah. That's good. That's good. I have nothing else to add. That's all that was real good. <laughs> <laughs> so real good. But you know that sports, you know, you know, it's amazing how what sports can do, you know. Yeah, absolutely. And, and yeah. that whole Michigan State, Michigan, and you know, in these co in these companies, how you know yeah. sports can 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 just a conversation alone can um, do a lot of good things for you. But yeah, that was that everything that they all said was great. I have nothing else to add. And, and you know what? I teach my girls that, Fred. And I'm sorry, I didn't list my wife and my girls. You know, I, they'll kill me if they find it, so don't tell Michelle. Uh, but, but but I tell my girls all the time, learn sports. Regardless if you're interested or not, mm -hmm. you know, sit there and look at the scores. And so I said, because as you get older, that's going to be a lot of the talk, you know, around the water mm -hmm. cooler. Now, my one daughter's graduating from Emory uh, in a couple of months, and, and and I told her it's important that you're, you're part of a group. So she didn't understand when I was really pressing her to be involved in some type of group. And she's like, but well, dad, you know, I'll do that. When I said, no, do it now. I said, it's important. Do it now. I said, I was part of NAVA. I said, the fraternity sororities, all, whatever. I said, be involved because you need to learn how to communicate with people from different backgrounds. Yeah, you need so to learn. And, and I said, because it's important. Networking is so important now. It was important then, but it's super important now that you, you can get a, get a job or lose a job or, or, or lose a promotion because you don't network with enough people. You don't go. They don't see you at the lunches. They don't see you come to the to the happy hours ever. You know, yep. I told her, you know, even if you go to the happy hour for five minutes, yep. they need to see your face because yep. people want to work with folks that they know can communicate. You know, you, the, some of the dumbest people, and excuse my language, yep. get promoted. I'm like, how did he or she get promoted? But because they at the happy hour. And they're drinking and people say, hey, they're a people person. They may not have all the knowledge, but they can, they'll can. they just build a team around them who will have the knowledge. And then they can. So I, I, I stress the importance to anybody watching about networking, 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 networking. That and is so sure, true. Be sure you join some group uh, and, and get, you know, get that diverse experience in dealing with people with different backgrounds. Even if they look like you and they're from Texas, they were raised differently. They see things differently. Learn. Where these people come from because you may be working with somebody from texas and you already know how they think or how they were raised so you gotta you gotta, you gotta teach folks how to how to master the in and out in five ten minutes of the networking group you know it's a, right. it's, a, it's a it's a way we've done it over the years it's a, it's a yeah. way to do that right you know come right. in shake some hands you know pat some people on the back grab a quick drink 
you know, and keep standing and keep walking and just, you know, I got to go, y'all. See you the next time, you know. Yeah, got to pick up the winning. kids, got to gotta pick up the wife, whatever your excuse to get out of there. But yeah. they see oh, yeah. They see it. It's see important you. to be seen. That's the importance. Mm -hmm. Yep. It's so true. Um, I'm just going to add a, a, a little bit there. Uh, for me personally, getting hired in right out of Michigan State at Motorola, which was the number one company to work for for engineers at the time, um, my, the guy who I interviewed with, he actually came to Michigan State and they were having like a series of different, you know, interview um, processes and things going on. And he I believe he hired me because he went to Michigan State. Like he was a graduate. He went through the engineering program. He knew what I must have gone through because he mm -hmm. did it. And he thought, well, she must be pretty good because I did that and I know what she went through. So I really believe that in part is why I got hired there. Um, I, I also had a couple other opportunities, but, you know, I, I kind of wanted to stay in the Midwest area not venture off too far, not knowing that having a degree from Michigan State University in the Midwest meant something. It means more than when I went and relocated to Boston and they're like, you know, we got MIT here, we got this and this and okay, Michigan State, Harvard, you know, well, you know, so it's like a whole different mm -hmm. mindset depending on what region you're in and what schools are hot in that region. Uh, so but by that time I had already had my experience and things, so that didn't really matter so much. But just thinking about it too, as a uh, a young uh, younger man or woman that's trying to figure out where they want to go in the end game. If you know you want to maybe work in New York City, right? You may want to go to a school on the East Coast, and mm -hmm. I only say that because you're going to get a different respect level of that school. Not to say it's no respect for Michigan State. But that's mm -hmm. that's hot here in the Midwest, I can tell you, because I go to school with people that I mean, I see I work with people who, you know, were at Ohio State and U of I and Wisconsin and, you know, all of that, because it's all kind of in the same spot. Right. But, you know, if you go east, you might get one or two. Like I, I, I noticed the difference, too, is like I like the Michigan State, you know, paraphernalia. Well, you'll never see that in Boston. Like the whole time I was in Boston, I never saw anybody with MSU stuff on. Uh, as I moved closer into like the, the uh, I would say Western New York, you start seeing it a little bit more because it's getting closer to the Midwest. But it, it you know, as you could just tell what people, what resonates to them. Now it's like, if I hear somebody say go green, it's like, whoa, okay, go white. You know, I'm in, you know, New York, and they're saying this is pretty cool. But um, that's something to think about. If you want to be in the South, maybe you um, want to go to a school in the South because there's those schools down there are respected. They got they got a lot of folks that went to school in their like backyards, and so that that's definitely something to to consider. And one last thing uh, about the sports for me, I started a, a, a women's golf league. Black Women's Golf League in Chicago. There were other Black professional women who we knew that we were going to get into the C-suite at some point in our career. And the conversations, the deals and things are made on the golf course. Mm -hmm. And so we had to learn how to play golf. It actually ended up being fun, but you know, part of it was purposed that we went and took professional classes. We went out every Saturday and we played as a, you know, a group because we had to have those times. I've had conversations. I've had, I've had gone on golf outings with the president of Nokia. I've gone out with some of the top like CEOs, presidents, VPs of major corporations. I played with Verizon, you know, so it, it, um, it does matter because they'll say, well, they don't ever see anybody look like me. This is a little Brown girl from Detroit. You over here uh, playing golf with people who've been playing golf all their life. Their daddy played golf and their granddaddy and all that. Yeah. You know how to play golf? Yeah, oh, I got some tailor-made clubs here. And, you know, we're going to mm -hmm. get out there and do it. That is impressive. Like you said, Lloyd, having some connectivity with them, something that, that resonates with them, that you have a commonality with uh, the people who typically are doing the, the promotions and moving people and advancing them in their careers. Now, if you're just going to, you know, work and you got a job, 
and you go home and that's the end of it. And then you, your mind shuts off at five o'clock and it shuts back on at nine. That's a different thing. But if you're really trying to move and shake and make a, an impact and, and have your name out there, you're going to have to get out of your comfort zone. You're going to have to do things that you never thought you would do before. You're going to have to, uh, you know, shake hands with people who you never thought you would even ever mm-hmm. meet in your life. It, it's, it's really, an, you know, you got to go international too. That's another yeah, thing. You got to sure, find yeah. yourself, you know, traveling the world. So think those things in mind. And it all depends on what you want to do, I guess, with your career. But mm-hmm. I think that you as a young individual, when somebody gives you the opportunity to say, why don't we go to Paris and do this exchange program? Or why don't we do that? Go do it. Please go do it. Because you always have that story to tell somebody. Oh, yeah, when I was an undergrad, you know, I did a stint over in Spain for a while. And I did the, what? Really? This little girl from Detroit, when you was over doing what? You know, it, it does make a difference because you are competing but not only the people that look like you, but all the people that don't look like you who usually get the the leg up already. So right. this can really differentiate you. And why would they want to come for you? And and one last thing, I'm going to say, it's not my show. It's good. It is, it's good. It's your show. Yeah. It but is here's, good. Here's, a, here's another thing that I noticed is that, oh boy, I'm telling you, it, 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 <laughs> when you... Uh, like like you were saying, Marie, when you start moving up the ladder, it start looking less and less like you. Mm-hmm. So my experience at a PWI, in a sense, in my engineering class, it was just me in many cases. I might have been the only black in my class. I might have been one or two other women in my class. It literally is no different than when I'm in the boardroom. Right. Mm-hmm. I mean, I'm most times it's just me. And I've gotten so comfortable with it just being me that I almost forget that it's just me because I'm just there to do the job. But there's other people around you who don't forget that you are the only black and, you know, they got their own little whatever going on. But you can't let that shake you just like in a PWI. If you're in an engineering class, you got to pass. So I don't care if nobody else looks like you. Nobody want to talk to you. Nobody want to study with you or whatever. That's life. You know, mm-hmm. I mean, I mean, it's, it's and so I, I remember um, at Motorola when we had some people who graduated from HBCUs and they were talking about, oh, we were in this uh, utopia and it was just all black and it was just black. And I said, that's wonderful, but that's not the real world. Right. The real world is the people like in here. Do you see a utopia here? This is what you really got to deal with. So it was a, a transition for them from all of that having. OK, so if you came from Detroit and you went to an HBCU, then so you kind of used to this this black pattern and you go in the workforce it's like wait 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 what happened they pulled the rug on me you know it, it mm-hmm. looks totally different now we got that shock early on <laughs> if you came from detroit you knew what you were going to expect when you got into corporate because it really wasn't any different right mm-hmm. so i just want to say real quick real quick because uh we're talking i know we're talking a lot about corporate america right but those same those same um networking you know things that you have to do you know those that networking and, and, and that moving and shaking and, and being out there it applies not only to corporate it applies to if you if you're an entrepreneur and, yes. and if you're in nonprofit yes. too you, I, you so just stole, you just stole my thunder because i was about to say that if you have an entrepreneurial <laughs> spirit you still have to make those connections because those are the people who are going to be your customers there you mm-hmm. go. and you still you have to always sell yourself always be in the mindset that you have to sell yourself, be on your best mm-hmm. behavior, always, no, no matter where you are. Don't cut up and think that people aren't watching because they are watching you. They're they watching are. your work ethic. They're watching, you, you know, your networking skills. Relationship management is probably one of the most important skills that a lot of folks don't yeah. realize yes. that will help you get to where you need to be. Will help you get if you're a, a senior associate. It'll help you get those assignments. It'll help get you those that visibility. So even if you don't get promoted at your current company, it's going to give you the confidence and the experience to get promoted at another company. So just be sure that you keep those type of things in mind of who your internal clients are, your external clients. And if you want to go into business for your own, for yourself, you come right back to those same folks who mm-hmm. you were comfortable and network with to become your customers. There you go. Mm-hmm. That's so right. And, you know, I love the fact that the the youth today are more entrepreneurial in spirit. Mm-hmm. It seems like that, that, 
door has been open for them. Whereas for our generation, it was literally, you go to, you know, graduate from high school, you go right to college, you know, get you a job, you know? Mm-hmm. And then our parents, at least in my case, they stayed on the job forever. Yeah. You know, yeah. mm-hmm. we learned a, a rude awakening in this thing because you know, I'm sure no one has had their same job. Okay. You you did in a sense you're 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 rare you're one quarter of probably the population right because you you it just doesn't work that way for us in most cases anymore for anyone but it, whether you're of color or not it just is not the the way of the world anymore um, it it just changes but kind of speaking on that we're gonna go back to the the, the college side of this and talking about how we have to learn how to work with different people who may not look like us and and, and have same backgrounds as us. On your uh, respective college campuses, did you feel like you had to change or assimilate or uh, change your blackness to fit in at all? No. Again, the the, the key, and and, and again, Fred and Maria expound on this, but the key is to find a commonality. And knows that you're, you know, again, the commonality I had with the people from different backgrounds that we were trying to graduate and we were all accounting majors. So that was our commonality. So I didn't have to <laughs> sell myself short and not be black in order to study to pass the test. Right. You know, I didn't have to to discount my blackness in order to go to a sporting event with my white friend. You know, those mm-hmm. are things you don't have to do or even go to a white party. I had a, a real close white friend there. And I went to, you know, his house, his his fraternity house and hung out with him. And, and never did I compromise who I was in order to do that. We found a commonality that we had and we and we we embellished that. So I would yeah. say no. In my case, no. Never had to discount who I was, where I was from and, uh, you know, who I wanted to be. I, I always sort of stayed that. Now, again, you learn how to network and you, you listen and learn. But that doesn't mean you have to so-called sell out. Yeah. In order to do that, you know, you, right. you you do have to understand you can't, you know, and it's not I don't use the term ghetto. I, I don't believe in that term per se, but you don't have to discount your blackness. And being black doesn't mean certain things that some people have stated it should be these days. Oh, you got to talk Ebonic. What's Ebonic? Right. You know, I, right. I, don't, I don't know what, what? you know, yeah. you just talk, you, you talk, you communicate properly. And mm-hmm. I don't have to be talking white. Or talking black, it just be being able to communicate mm-hmm. with those who you need to get the message across. That's right. Yeah. Uh, well said. Well said. Anybody yeah. want to add to that? I think for me, uh, definitely. I was. We were so entrenched in who we were coming from Detroit. They called me Miss Black Detroit because nobody from New York or you know they they never met people from Detroit before. And they're like, what? Is, what do y'all drink in Detroit to make y'all just rep your city so hard? So I was always um, very true to who I was. And I remember I, I spoke on another podcast yesterday. And I think if anything, I even identified being more black because I was always the only black. So when I interviewed for my jobs in corporate America, I specifically went with my hair and braids. Thank mm-hmm. you, thank you. I had them in the micro mini braids, but they were braids. And I put in a nice low bun. And because I wanted to make a statement 30 years ago, like they they, they just passed a law about it. I forgot the name of the law. Yeah, the, the hair law. law. I know what you're talking about. The, the Crown Act, my daughter. Yeah, the Crown yeah. Act. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> um, but in 1996, when I was interviewing, I really made a statement. I'm like, I really want people to hire me for who I am. And I don't want to have to change what I look like. Um, and I didn't wear my hair and braids all the time. But when I interviewed, I wanted to check your pulse. Wow. If it would go. And so I never um, compromised. And I don't think any, I would encourage no one in any aspect to compromise who they are authentically to fit in any group. Even in the Black Student Union, there were Black students who didn't feel comfortable being in the Black Student Union because their culture and experience was different than the the dominant culture within that. Mm-hmm. But I think that that can cause a lot of problems mm-hmm. if you really try to change who your authentic self is. So I yeah. don't recommend that at all. Yeah, yeah. 
Yep, didn't have to change at all. Like I said earlier, we um, you know, a lot of people that I you know met, white students that I met were intrigued by us. You know, being from Detroit, being black, you know, they were a lot of those um folks were learning about us, right? Because they never went to high school, never went to you know had any of their um, black friends in middle school or elementary school. So, so with some of those folks, it was their first time meeting um. Black people, so they were, you know, like I said, my people were intrigued by us, and so, you know, we didn't have to, we didn't have to change, we didn't have to, like you said, sell out, we didn't do anything, and we did everything, you know, we, you know, I went, we went to white parties, we hung out with some of those things too, but like I said, we did a lot of black stuff too, so, right, yeah, and we even had some of some of the white people, you know, some of my white friends come to black stuff, so it was, um, it was right. interesting. Yep, so. Very good, very good. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm gonna check. Um, I know I got some more questions, but I'm gonna see if we have any on here because uh, oh, we got four comments. Let me let me see. Make sure I can read all of these. This first one is from Sean Smith says, my father told me he would not pay for me to go to an HBCU unless I was majoring in education. He said, ironically, I graduated in mathematics education. So that was the thought there. Um, let's see. The smart universities have programs that help Black students acclimate. Some would look, uh -oh, some would look at that as negative as if we couldn't hang with them, but they didn't know what they were really doing. They allowed us to connect with each other and together we were unstoppable. Mm -hmm. I, I, I think they did know what they were doing. Mm -hmm. I, I think so, but. Yeah, um, this mm -hmm. is from Rick Stringer. Fascinating, hearing a POC student's experience is the Hinterland School of UVM, just wow, my alma mater, PSU, also also rural, remote, and mountainous. But mm -hmm. we at least had higher POC enrollment, people of color. Thank you. And then this one is for Lloyd. So much formal networking on the golf course, booting, civic events, etc. Great example you cited. So mm -hmm. just really good um, feedback from the people um, on the chat here. Um, let me see what time it is. I usually always run over time. Yep, I, of course we did. We ran over time. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I had more questions to ask y'all, but- um, Part two. Yeah, we can, that's yeah, right. Yeah, you can do part two for sure. Yeah, yeah. Let's, let's think about that. I know um, next month I'm gonna do the HBCUs. So I'm going to um, solicit some people. So people who are listening now or on the replay, if you want to be on the panel and you went to an HBCU and graduated and want to give us your counter to what we've just talked about here, feel free to hit me up in the DM and let me know that you are interested. Um, well, I'm not going to hold us much longer, but I will give each of you about 30 seconds to give your final thoughts or advice or information you want to share with the uh, smack nation before we close out here and we'll start um with you fred hi um this is um this has been a great panel discussion uh even more information and, and than i thought but i guess the only thing that i would um leave with was, was kind of based on that last thought that we had that anything that you um any type of network and anything that you've learned you know, through your, you know, university life, being at a PWI, you know, it, it, you know, you make sure you take that into your corporate life, into your, if you're a nonprofit and you're, or if you're in entrepreneurship, those skills that you acquire are going to be needed in all different phases of, um, of your of life, you know, your growth in, in yeah. your life. So that would be the only thing that I would uh, reiterate, you know, from this, um, you know, from this panel discussion. Thanks, Fred. How about mm -hmm. you, Marie? I think the, the one thing that I want, the biggest takeaway is for everyone to make the decision that's best for them. Mm -hmm. And that you sit down and take time to see what's most important to you. 
and do your research on the culture and the climate of wherever you go and that it best fits you as an individual. And lastly, um, when you start choosing your institution of higher education, really consider what part of the region of this country you want to live in because oftentimes mm -hmm. That's a good point. kind of matriculate into that mm -hmm. area. That's where your biggest network is. I too have enjoyed the, the dialogue with you guys today and offered my little experience at Vermont. <laughs> hey, it's unique and it was well appreciated. Thank you, mm -hmm. Marie. Very and, good. And Lloyd, we'll close with you. Shirt. Ah, okay, I'm sorry. To see that Illinois, huh? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I, I just want to reiterate what, what Fred and Marie said, you know, just be sure that, and, and again, I didn't learn this term PWI until I moved out here to DC. Don't worry about that. Go to school, go to college, go to college, get your education and whatever you want to major in, make sure that school can offer you what you need. And, and, you know, I agree with the whole territory thing. Cause again, living in the Midwest, you know, the schools in the Midwest are going to have more alumni working at these companies in the Midwest, but don't worry about that either. Just make sure you go to school. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and that's what's important. We need to keep our kids focused on going to school and not worrying about, oh, it's PWO, oh, it's HBC. Go to school. Go to school. Major what you're going to love. You know, if you know what you're going to love and if you don't, you know, test things out. But just yeah. be sure that you go to school, get that education and keep it moving. But the, the most important thing that I don't think that we mentioned, make sure you get some mentors, people from yes. your neighborhood, people from the school you want to go to. You can always find you guys, you guys have so many. I'm talking to the, the students, uh, the young students and the potential students now. You guys have so many opportunities to network and to obtain mentors and tutors. There, there's so many more majors than when we had when we were in school. Entrepreneurship is a major that yes. wasn't as prevalent. Risk management is a major. That's my field. I'm like, I wish it was out mm -hmm. when I was, you know, younger. You guys have so many opportunities, but make sure you get a mentor, somebody who's going to walk you and guide you. And talk to you. And I'm not talking about your counselor at school. I'm talking about some adult, somebody, cold letters. If you have to write a person, say, hey, I see you're a graduate of University of Illinois or Michigan State or University of Vermont, and I'm, I'm interested in that school or I'm interested in this major. Can you please, you know, take the time to, you know, tell me a little bit about the school or tell me a little about the field? And you'll be surprised if folks will write you back. I know I would mm -hmm. because I want to make sure that I help. That, that's that's my cause to help and, and uplift. And that's the way mm -hmm. to uplift. So do not be afraid to reach out to people either in your parent circle, your family circle, or just cold letters to where you look for a mentor who was, is willing to give you advice to help guide you on your path. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can guarantee you uh, pretty much anybody that you reach out to that has gone through what we're talking about, who's done this path, this journey is going to be more than happy to give you that advice. I, I guess I just didn't know enough. Like Marie, you were saying at the top of the call, um, we just didn't know. We didn't have enough information. Now there's so much information and pretty much like all of my friends have gone to college. So at least my children have all of that as resources and access, right? And so yep. hopefully anybody who's listening to this, you have Smack Nation now, you join Smack Productions. There's tons of people on there who are college graduates. And I, I can assure you, that they'd be more than willing to help. Think well, how dangerous we would have been if we had the internet back in the man, day. Man, man, wait, wait. I Ooh. should have mentioned Lloyd is the founder of our Big Ten Black Alumni Network on Facebook. This network is, whoo, we got about what, almost 12,000 people on there from 14 different PWIs, okay? And I tell you what, that's a resource right there. And that's an amazing resource. Imagine one of your children, niece, nephew, neighbor, or whatever is thinking about going to one of those 14 schools. We just got to go type, type, type and say, hey, I got somebody that anybody can help give some information to this young individual yeah. and I'm, it'll flood in. And yeah. I, I'm so, so gracious that you uh, um, asked me to be an admin of that because uh, you know, we've got quite a few people at, from Michigan State on there, and I just think it's a, a wonderful vehicle. So if anybody who's from a Big Ten and you're Black and you are a graduate of that university, you should try to join that network. It is absolutely amazing. We have fun. We talk 
uh, so many serious issues. It's just a real constructive environment. And so I'm just going to close with that. And before, though, I'd like to give a special thanks to our amazing panelists, uh, Marie Warsham Banks, Fred Crutcher, and Lloyd Stallings. And I'd like to thank all of you out there in Smack Nation. If you haven't joined Smack Productions on Facebook or YouTube, please do so and invite your family and friends to join as well. Well, that's our show. And of course, you know, we always run over on Smack Productions. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why it is. We just, when we get together, it's like family. So, you yeah, know, that's sure. how it is, you know. And uh, like I said, next month is HBCU. So if you're interested, uh, please hit me up in a DM and uh, we'll talk. And I only, you see, it's a, a small group to keep it down because we could really be here half a day talking about this topic, but we're going to keep it small. But uh, it's going to be informative and fun. That's what we love here. And, and I hope this was educational and enlightening and, and energized you to really consider if you are looking at a PWI, uh, some of the things that you need to keep in mind. Well, with that, I'd like to say thank you, everyone, and have a very good night. Good night, good night everybody. Good night.